Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Pyrograph Live. I'm your host, Perry Packrew. I'm the editor and publisher of Pyrograph, which is an online magazine featuring first-person posts from working artists worldwide. Check us out at pyrograph.com. Um, last week, I got a call from the fine folks over at Trick Lock Company. It's a theater ensemble here in Albuquerque. They produce all kinds of incredible productions um, and year-round, and also a signature international theater festival called Revolutions, and that's coming up in March. They wanted to know if I would be interested in interviewing John Fugelsang. And it turns out he's performing this Saturday at the Chemo Theater in a performance that's a fundraiser for Trick Lock. It's called Unprecedented, uh, the true story of a comedian trying to raise a toddler while his country was electing one. Needless to say, I was thrilled to say yes, having been a fan of John and his work for many years, probably going back to, I think, the VH1 years, which I probably recorded on VHS tape, I think. Um, he has a very interesting and varied career, and these days I especially enjoy following his comedic take on politics, religion, and the hellscape we find ourselves living in under the great orange menace in the White House. John is the host of the Tell Me Everything series on Sirius XM, Insight Channel 121, is that right? Um, I've heard you describe it as NPR with penis jokes. Yeah, I Doesn't mean, better dick jokes than Carl Castle. Okay, yeah. good, good. So um, please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming John Fugelsang. Thank you, Perry. Thank yeah. you so much. Great to have you in my office uh, slash podcasting I, I, and video I casting studio. I love this whole setup. I love your studio. It's Thank fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. I share it with uh, Austin and Kendra, and we, we enjoy working together and watching the traffic go by. That's terrific. Um, so it's great to meet you, have you here in the office. Um, I'm excited to talk with you about the creative side of your work, how you've managed to build a, a varied career, varied being the, the yeah. operative word. Yeah, a working um, artist being the operative word. What do you call yourself? Because I could call you a comedian, a commentator. How do you um, comedian? Comedian is usually the, the most basic, but I'll go with comedian, actor, broadcaster, uh, writer, um, commentator, whatever it is, you know, whatever hat I'm wearing. I got into it originally to just be an actor, became a comedian for more stage time. I was talking a good bit about, like, horrible music, and that led to VH1 offering me uh, a VJ job back when they could still show music on VH1. And that was sort of like my broadcasting grad school, which led to me being a TV host on things uh, ranging from like PBS literary series to uh, America's Funniest Home Videos. And then from there, um, I've sort of just, I've sort of always wanted a career that would be as diverse as possible where I could do many different things. And I, right. I've always been hungry to have as, as varied a career. So I've done everything from like pop culture, comedy TV shows, to performing stand-up for the troops overseas, to um, acting in TV dramas and movies and and uh, and, and sitcoms, to uh, solo theater, um, experimental stuff off Broadway, to uh, being a political commentator. I, I one morning on I was a regular on uh, CNN for mornings for a year, and I got Mitt Romney's advisor to call him an etch a sketch. I've been picketed by uh, the Westboro Baptist Church doing stand-up with Margaret Cho in nice. Kansas City. I've done a I, I did a live broadcast from a two-man submersible submarine at the bottom of the Bermuda Triangle, uh, a talk show with like Lewis Black and Mark Hamill as phone-in guests. Um, I interviewed George Harrison and Paul McCartney in different continents in the same week. And really, uh, to me, it's just, I, I've always had a career where I was hungry for experience and doing as many different things as I could. And you went ahead and did that. That's great. So it sounds like something your high school career coach probably said, this is what you should do. Oh, my high school career coach hung himself. But um, yeah, for me... Uh, is that true? No. <laughs> but um, for me, uh, you know, having running off and joining the circus was my backup job. Yeah. Well, I know from your background that you come from... Your parents were uh, had lives in the church. That's a mild way of putting it. Yes. Uh, your mother was a, a nun. Mm -hmm. and your father, a, a Franciscan monk? A Franciscan brother. Brother. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, how did they feel about you pursuing creative, theatrical, dramatic pursuits? Um, I was very was lucky. Something? Were they supportive? Yeah, I was lucky as a creative person that my parents were incredibly supportive. My dad was always very big. My dad wanted me to teach public school, just like him, and become an administrator and hate my job as much as him, but uh, always supportive. <laughs> my, both my parents like, were public school teachers. Retired, really? So I, yeah. I know that. Yeah. Well, my dad loved teaching, but then when he had to become an administrator because yeah. he had kids, yeah. then he lost the fun of performance. Yeah. And, and that was uh, educational for me on many levels. But like when I was a child, my first paid work as an artist was age 11 years old in a regional theater production of Christmas Carol where I was paid like $3 
per show. Next, I was in a production of Hamlet, where for like four months of my life, I was working with adults. I was the player queen in the play within a play. I was paid $5 per show. And after that, going back to playing Atari with my friends from junior high school just seemed kind of boring. Yeah. So um, I was lucky enough to have a dad who would come and sit in the back row of rehearsals and wait for me to rap to bring me home. And uh, so I, I was very blessed. Uh, they were a little concerned with the stand-up comedy. Um, but then when my dad would see me like you know, fighting David Duke or Jerry Falwell on Bill Maher, I won his love back. Awesome. So, yeah. Well, that's a good segue to my next question, which is when did you either decide or find yourself um, gravitating towards political, you know, in integrating political themes and topics into your work, your theater work, your comedic work? Was that an accident or did it just start to... It was more a failure of impulse control than anything yeah. else because um, political stand-up is one of the dumbest disciplines a creative person can go into. Uh, you're guaranteed of having at least half the audience resent you before you right. open your mouth if you're on the wrong team. The material has a very short shelf life. Like, oh my God, after six years, I can bring back my Mitt Romney jokes? They're in a box in the attic. This is great. And, and also, it's very hard to get on TV doing political comedy unless... It's your own TV show. You'll notice most of the late night comics uh, don't have political stand ups. They'll do politics, but they won't have guests who riff about it. But for me, I became a comedian because I saw George Carlin live. Uh -huh. And he did something no artist had ever done up to that point. He made me feel like I wasn't crazy, like I wasn't alone. And it was at a time when, after the first Persian Gulf War, which had a 93% approval rating. Oh, yeah. Everyone, it was a feel-good war, restoring yeah. the dictator of a country where women were property for freedom. And um, our country lost its damn mind. And Bill and, and George Carlin, my friend, said, come out and see Carlin. And I thought, oh, I'll go see the dick jokes. And he came out. And this is the Jamming in New York tour, launched into a venomous, a brilliantly funny piece about that war. And I just thought, wow, I... I I want to do something like this when I grow up. And so my dad was a history teacher. How old were you at this time? I was like 20 maybe. Roughly. Yeah. Okay. And my dad was a history teacher. I sucked at sports. So to earn his love, I got into this. And it's been really, really satisfying. Agents and managers hate it because I talk a lot about politics, which does limit you. And I talk a lot about religion yeah. and Christianity and fundamentalist Christianity, which isn't actual Christianity at all. It's evangelical supremacy but um that stuff really marginalizes you and i had a lot of agents at william morris tell me to stop it but if you're into branding and into being your own person you have to listen to your inner voice even if it seems not commercially viable and then you can find a balance so i'll have the tv job where i can go do what i got to do to subsidize the creative work that you really need to do that's really interesting. I'm, I'm a business consultant, but you know, I wear a lot of different hats as a self-employed person. And yeah, there's so much advice. Don't don't tackle politics. Don't talk about yeah, politics. Yeah. Don't. And um, it is very niche. But it, and I do think if you do it, yeah, you have to be able to do it, and then be able to go on public or go on stage and not do it. Sure. Like if I get invited to a show and it's no politics, to me it's very refreshing because you want to be able to wear both hats. Yeah. But I think that if you have something inside of you that you want to get out creatively and yes. you can make a living doing it or at least try to that's the kind of authenticity i think exactly. people are hungry for i was just going to say if it's authentic you know i see businesses i hear businesses on the radio c catering to a liberal crowd yeah and you can tell that is something the owners really really feel strongly about so as a as a coach or consultant i'm not going to tell them oh you know shut up about politics that's and f uh, if, in my case i am a loud mouth about politics on uh, social media all the time, but I didn't always. I wasn't always. Yeah. And I kind of had to tip my way, tiptoe my way through, feeling like what is what just feels like something I've got to say. Well, also because you know? you, you're right because you can't let yourself be pigeonholed as well. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm proud to say that every uh, conservative brother and sister I've ever had on my any of my TV shows or my radio show has had a good time and has said they would come back. And and that's yeah. something that has meant a lot to me because. You know, I, 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 my my policy is fair and biased. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, that, you can't be fair. and It is not possible to be fair and balanced at the same time. Yeah, yeah. So, person who uh, doesn't like killing puppies, let's have some balance and bring in the guy who... It doesn't work that way. So, yeah. you have to be authentic, but I also think if you let yourself be a hater, you're antagonizing half of your potential base. Yeah. I, I go on Fox News a lot, and 
some of the people who like my stuff or my friends don't like that I do that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I'm getting Governor Chris Christie to come on my radio show, and some of my friends were very unhappy that I would do that. But I, I like I've had Trent Lott on my radio show. You know, like I've had I, I had Got on my TV show it. I had everybody from from Kellyanne Conway to Scotty Nell Hughes. It's like I don't want to do something where. I'm just sitting around getting along with people I agree with. A room full of liberals agreeing with each other uh, is entertainment death. Yeah. And so for me, um, and I really pissed off my sidekick. He does not want me to have Chris Christie on my show. And I'm like, too bad. I'm going to interview him in my own way because I don't just want to let myself be pigeonholed. And sure. I do believe that you can be true to your passion while also being open-hearted enough that you're not alienating people yeah. who aren't necessarily in the... Uh, the realm you're trying to reach. Well, it's interesting because we live in such a polarized, divided time. Uh, one of the things I like about your comedy and commentary is it, it, it feels to me that you're trying to bring people together. But I'm sure people call you divisive. All the time, Because you yeah. call out hypocrisy, hypocrites, uh, that's something I learned mean from, people. Yeah, that's Jesus, by the way. Well, uh, Jesus never condemned anybody for their sex life, uh, never was cruel to the poor people, uh, never punched down. Jesus' right. big thing was not calling out sin. It was calling out hypocrisy. And that mm-hmm. was one of my biggest lessons from the kind of Christianity I was raised with, which mm-hmm. is to say the stuff that's in the actual Bible. And um, at a very young age, I, I realized, wow, you can't be a right-wing, reactionary, uh, xenophobic, homophobe, and still say that you're a Christian. Now, this really gets people angry. Yeah. So I've had to spend a lot of time in my life, and I'm, I'm writing a book about this that I've been working on forever, called Separation of Church and Hate. Because Great title. It, when in the religious realm, I'm really trying to carve a very strange niche. There are progressive theologians and academics, but not a lot of comedians who take this stuff on. But there's no one out there doing it. And I saw there was... a a real void. And I would talk about, you know, what the Bible actually says versus what the Falwells and Mike Pence's of the world claim it says. And the response was so powerful from people on the radio and clubs, on TV, that um, I decided I wanted to go deeper into it. And it's proving very relevant now because in our media culture, if you talk religion, you you have two choices, the atheist or the douchebag screaming at women outside clinics. And that's it. I think the majority of Americans were raised religious, now consider themselves spiritual. Mm-hmm. And this is including agnostic people, too, who like, well, there could be something, but I'm, I'm not going to join any club with a guy in a funny hat and a dress yeah. telling me who's going to hell. And so I kind of feel like that's a big ma- ma- majority that hasn't been tapped into that I've been trying to reach with my work. I would consider myself loosely in that in that crew. I was yeah. not raised... In- I was not raised in any kind of religious with any with any religion. My dad's from well, Iran. So well adjusted. Oh, well, yeah. so I don't have any baggage. We just it wasn't part of our life. In fact, I was like, why don't we go to church? I mean, it looks fun. You know, it was like a club, you know. Yeah. But I don't have the. I find it interesting, and so. Um, but for somebody who actually has a a, a foundation in Christianity, um, Catholicism, correct? Yeah. Um, gosh, it must be so disappointing to see what happened. What what passes for Christian uh, uh, action. Or, oh, it, I mean, it enrages God, me. It must, I mean, yeah, you're it a, it's like America. You're, you have the freedom to hate gay people. You have the freedom to hate Muslims. You have the freedom to shit on marginalized people and, and, and want to turn away war refugees. Mm-hmm. You have the freedom to vote for a guy who grabs women by the pussy and mocks disabled people and has a tax plan that benefits the rich and ignores the spoiling of our air and water. You can do all that. You just don't get to call yourself a Christian while you vote that way. Yeah. And you know what? That enrages the right people. Yeah. And in my case, I welcome it because uh, I've spent many years um, researching the Bible. And again, agents and managers have a heart attack over this. But like, I will debate any fundamentalist any day um, on uh, LGBT rights mm-hmm. or what, what Jesus says, what the Bible says about women's reproductive rights uh, or birth control or how you're supposed to treat immigrants. The, the modern conservative Christian movement in America is against the teachings of Jesus on virtually every subject. And I have gotten to a place where I welcome any debates with people about it because I actually yeah. know it's in the Bible. And again, I was drawn to do this both as a passion for an injustice I saw, but also realizing in the entertainment market, and believe me, it's funny. Yeah. I mean, if you come to the show, there, there's dick jokes too. But, um, <laughs> you know, to me it's like, 
you have to look for where are their untapped markets and where are people uh, finding a void and how can you fill that with whatever weird freaky thing makes up you. When I was a kid, I was the most Christian kid and the most liberal kid and I felt like a freak for it. Interesting. But whatever makes you a freak as a young person makes you unique as an adult and so I learned about branding a bit late in the game but it's a, it's a powerful sorcery to learn. And you grew up in New York, is that correct? Long Island, yeah. Long Island. Um, yeah, the Isle of Long. In the heart of the Butterfugo Belt. Yeah, I, I saw uh, one of the uh, talks or panel discussions that you were on. Um, you mentioned that you're liberal because you were raised Christ Christian and you go by what's in the Bible and not what the revoltingly fake woman-hating charlatans that call themselves Christian leaders of this country pass off. A little preachy, but yeah, that's true. Well, but it, it is, I mean, would you say that we're at a low point with this particular president and this particular base that has been um, activated uh, right now with the, the gap between um, what Christian... Um, uh, Ethics right. and I mean, it, I know it seems that way. I would argue that um, claiming you're Christian while your country keeps people as slaves is quite a bit lower than the star of Celebrity Apprentice being president. Yeah, uh, we've been much worse on the fake Christian thing in terms of Japanese citizens dropping an atomic bomb on civilian targets. Um, yeah, you know, uh, uh, we've always had this struggle in America of the goodness versus the the selfishness of, of the empathy versus the cruelty. And um, as ugly as it is now in politics, I mean, we forget John Adams accused Thomas Jefferson of fathering slave children and selling his own children in their lifetimes in the press. And it turns out he was right. So what divides us now, it, it's just a new version of an old thing. Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt were hated every bit as much as the Clintons and the Obamas yeah. in their day. So all these divisions take on new forms. But I think it's – and again, I think Trump is an extension of like, the know-nothings from 150 years ago. It's – these kinds of movements rise and fall, and it's actually really cyclical. There's usually, right. uh, I mean, we think, oh my God, a cheesy celebrity, a cheesy, no talent celebrity embarrassment who used to be a Democrat, but now is this right wing fascist, becomes president. Well, that's what older folks were saying about Reagan 30 years ago. Yeah. You know, it, it, it just keeps on happening. That helps me feel better. <laughs> Look, there's. This is why I don't get down about it. Yeah. And, and again, I'm a history junkie. Like every every positive advancement in civil rights has led to a negative backlash, mm -hmm. right? We ended slavery, but you got Jim Crow. Uh, you have the civil rights movement, but that leads to uh, the drug war um, and the Southern strategy. You get the first black president, and that leads to this racist reality show clown. Uh, but in each one of these cases, the backlash to the backlash is also a beautiful thing. You would not have... Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez in the House of Representatives had Hillary Clinton won. And I wish we were all sitting around, you I know, complaining about sure. how much President Hillary Clinton sucks, incrementalist, blah, blah, blah. Right. But I saw so much goodness. I was at the Women's March in D.C. that weekend. Yeah. I was at the anti-Muslim ban march in Battery Park, New York. I brought my kindergartner to it. And all the faith in the country I lost ha has been restored. And I think we have to go through these, these cycles of apathy and apathy won the last presidential election, 46%. Yeah. Trump yep. came in third. So uh, I do think that as shitty as all this is, I have to believe good comes from it because yeah. I'm a father now and I have to pretend to be an optimist. Right, right. No, I agree. I mean, so many people are more engaged than they had been. I'm more engaged. Um, friends of mine are now precinct captains and ward captains and, you know, and doing things and paying a lot more attention. And, um, you know, and I'm, I just turned 50 and I have always been what I thought was active and aware, mm -hmm. but um, n no more so than in the last two years. Is, you know, it's yeah. definitely woken up a lot of people. So I think that's that's a good thing. You know, Donald Trump paid for my son to go to private preschool in Manhattan, so I owe that man a lot. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. How do you stay sane, and how do you get, how do you turn off from the news? Because, I mean, you, you do a daily radio show, yeah. right? You're yeah. talking about news all the time. Obviously, <laughs> you must process uh, through your comedy and through your work, but how else do you, like, find downtime to... Just recharge and, and well, get away from the day-to-day -day cycle. It's a great question because we both know a lot of really good people who have lost their damn minds and either burn out and just tune out of everything and want to be apathetic and not pay attention or go too far and become liberal trolls with purity tests and, and you know, if you don't agree with me, 100% fuck you. Um, 
so for me on the radio show, for example, when they first offered me this this uh, show on a new channel they were building, I said to Sirius XM, as long as politics can only be half of what I do. I said, I don't want to do a political show. Half politics, half everything else. So we have rock stars and comedians and rappers and you know, uh, movie stars and directors and authors and historians, tech people, sex, family, relationships, nutrition. To me, it's very, very cool. important to balance it. And if you're into all this politics, it should only be half of your diet. Like, you got If you're really into this and you care, you have to be able to unplug and exercise have fun with friends, have great sex, uh, do cultural things, go to museums, have... The one thing about the, the internet, uh, the internet killed hobbies. That's one thing I will say I, I think is true. Yeah. And you have to be able to unplug from all of it and, and recharge your own battery and remember that this is the stuff that really matters. The life stuff is the stuff that really matters because right. when we're old, it's going to be really a drag to look back on the time when we really, really, really cared about Jeff Sessions. Like, when we really, you know, when all of our energy was into, like, uh, you, you know, Brett Kavanaugh. Oh, my. Like, so right. fill it up with memories, too. The good ones, I mean. Yes. Filling up the time. Well, you have a child now, too. And yeah, you said horrible, how yeah. You have a toddler. Is uh, he's in first grade now. Yeah. Your child is referenced in the title he of is. Unprecedented. Um, and so he, uh, so that I'm sure is a is a powerful pull into being present in real life. Yeah, but as you know, having a child is also a demanding, unforgiving job at times as well. So you need to have your escape beyond there. Exactly. Um, and you need to find a way to uh, to really balance yourself and let yourself be sane. And that's why I want to talk to all of you about the Church of Scientology <laughs> and what we can do to change the direction of your life. Um, no, it's just you, you need balance, especially... Yeah. Being grown-ups, yeah, which is the shittiest job they've invented yet. Yeah, I don't know if you consider yourself uh, what your status is as a self-employed person or a, in, an independent, you know, creative person. But um, we were talking a little bit before the show about the difficulty for creative people to find uh, a way to succeed, especially economically, yeah. in this world really dominated by shareholder-driven corporate media, corporate content factory, stuff like that. Um, what have yep. you learned along the way? Again, you, you know, you've pursued variety. Um, yeah. you haven't, uh, but what have you learned along the way f that might be a value to um, creatives seeking a path that you know, um, prioritizes independent thinking and creative thinking and not becoming a cog in corporate content creation? Absolutely. Well, one of them is just what you said, I mean, diversifying. Like, even if you have one area of passion, try to diversify that as much as possible and find as many different ways to do it. I mean, I was having a time last year when at one point I was doing a, a syndicated TV show for Fox about pop culture, my radio show where I'm interviewing like movie stars and, and authors, and then my political stand-up tour. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you wear a lot of hats at once. I, I've, I've learned... Uh, the hard way how perilous it can be for a creative person. Um, I first incorporated when I got my first uh, network TV job and had an LLC and learned how all that stuff works and had a business manager who felt 5% of my pain. And what happened then was really strange. I went through a period where I was being put up for a lot of TV jobs that I really didn't want. I had hosted a, a show, America's Funniest Home Videos, when I first moved to LA. I was very young. And I knew after about a season that this was not for me. I love the money, but it's not, you know, I learned early on that being paid a lot of money for work you're not proud of is not success. Your representatives will love it, but you know, you won't. And sometimes that's okay. If you have a child, you gotta go out and you know do other stuff. So um, I was getting a lot of work acting, but it would be like a sitcom here or a little film role here, not the same kind of money. So after a couple of years, like I, I said, I'm going to do funny home videos so I can be a starving artist in L.A. for a couple of years. I'm just going to put the money in the bank and then just audition and be an out-of-work actor. And that worked until the day my business managers <laughs> decided to drop me as a client because I wasn't taking the big money jobs. And I had to dissolve my corporation. And I learned, oh, the government gets to keep half my pension, and that's the best case scenario. So a lot of it is just, Bummer. yeah, but a lot of it is just getting out there, trial and error, and learning the hard way and making the mistakes. And, you know, if you're going to enjoy the liberation that comes from running off and joining the circus and being an artist, and being that one at the high school reunion with, you know, the interesting stuff, you've also got to accept the fact that you're going to have years that will be harder than your friends who took a steady corporate job. 
Right. Yeah, yeah. We were talking about that earlier, the trade-off between the security and doing stuff that you know, lights your fire. And so often in my life, you know, you do the the work you have to do, the paycheck job you have to do yeah. to subsidize the creative work that we are called to do. And that's okay. And you're and there's no shame in that. None at all. Right. No. I mean getting a job I to know just many pay people the bills who struggle while you, yeah. with that with that, you know, like, oh I can't it's it's you know, it's compromising me. And I can't, you know, it, it's. I'm, I know. I'm selling out, but if, if it's in balance. But like I say, like you know, that's what adulthood is. Adulthood yeah. is all compromise. Yeah. I mean, picking out what dessert you're going to have is compromise. And and so, being an artist, anyone who says that they're never going to compromise is probably independently wealthy or doesn't know what they're talking about yet, because that's growth in the course of your career. You know, yeah, you're going to struggle. It's going to make you a better artist. It's going to make you a better writer and creative person. There has never been an interesting human who's had an easy life in history. Never. And so you got to be willing, and you know this, if you're going to try and make a, a career professionally as a creative, you have to be ready for years where you'll really want to show off at the high school reunion. And, uh, you know, like my when I had my 10-year reunion, I had just been to London and done a live special with Paul McCartney, and I was had just worked with George Harrison. For my 20-year reunion, I hadn't worked in a year, and I did not want to go. And that's the trade-off. Some years you make a lot. Some years it's pretty lean. Right. And that's that's okay, you know, You as long as you have something to, to fall back on or find a way to not be selling bone marrow on Craigslist, which I've also done, by the way. I have the best bone marrow, if you're anyone looking. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, it's free for you. What can you tell us about um, Unprecedented? And, um, and, and because the toddler is referenced in the title, I'm just curious, what can you tell us about... Um, you know, the, the topics that you cover in that and what have you, you know, what was this? I, I love the title. What, what is it again? Um, oh. Raising a toddler while we were electing one. I mean, um, what were the parallels that you, did you deal, do you have any advice on how we can child-proof our country? I mean, oh what God. can we do? Uh, yeah, a democracy, empathy, and education. Um, you know, <laughs> I think uh, bringing wi free Wi-Fi everywhere is going to be the rural electrification project of our century. Um, you know, I, I was on the road doing a lot of touring and just writing Trump jokes all the time. That's the unfair thing. Comedians have to keep writing new Trump material. Trump just recycles his old stuff over to, oh, you, 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 you campaigned on the Mexicans are going to come kill us and you lost 40 seats? Do more of that now. So I, I had all this material. I, I love doing solo theater. Spalding Gray was one of my heroes growing up. And um, I, I have done off-Broadway solo shows, and I began thinking, okay, I've got all this material. How can I make it more than just a collection of jokes? And I like to blend storytelling and stand-up wherever I can. I love doing straight-up storytelling shows, but bl blending stand-up and story was great. And so working in these threads of like, I thought I was never going to have a child. My wife and I were together 20 years. Everyone in my life started dying, so we had a kid. It was appallingly difficult and horrible. Babies are the worst people in the world. That's a whole other show. And then working in like how at one point I took a job going to work for the Fox Network thinking, hey, I've got to provide for my family. I'm going to stop talking politics and start making fun of Kardashians, and that's going to be authentic in its own way. Realizing six months then I couldn't do it. And so it was a matter of like taking different stories, blending them in with... Uh, all the hypocrisy and comedy that's inherent here. And so for me, it was uh, a great chance to like uh, creatively experiment with mixing genres and Trick Lock and Revolutions Festival has always been a place where you can do things like that. So for me, um, I was already developing this and working on recording an album later this winter. So when they asked me to come here and do something, I thought, oh, well, I have a couple of one-man shows, but let me try this uh, solo theater stand-up political hybrid. And I'm just so thrilled to be back here. I mean, I've, I've done that festival twice. I love Albuquerque. I've played Pope Joy Hall three times, the chemo once before. Yay. Revolutions twice. So it's really, really a joy to, to be back in town, to drag all of you down to my level. <laughs> What's your connection to Albuquerque? How do you do you know somebody here, or did the did the Trick Lock people just reel you in at some point? I, well, I first came here to do the Free Speech Comedy Festival as part oh, of yeah, uh, yeah. the Revolutions, like back in '08, and then I said, hey, you know, I just closed a solo show off Broadway. I got a Drama League nomination. Maybe come back, and so I, I came back a year later and did that. One of the best crowds I ever had. 
Um, made a lot of friends at Trick Lock. Uh, one of them, uh, I, 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 Kate Schrader, as an actor from uh, Albuquerque and Trick Lock, who is one of my closest friends, who I sort of stole, and she went up. Uh, she now works with my wife in New York wow. at the Vimeo company. So um, you know, it's it's been great to like actually uh, keep in touch with people back here through her, and. Honestly, you know how it is. It's the land of entrapment. You come yes, here, you fall in love, and a part of you never wants to leave. Yeah. I, I came, like many people, I came for school, left, and then I, I had to come back. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and now it's been almost it's 19 years, this last, wow. this last round. Yeah. Long time. Congratulations. Um, well, uh, I, I wanted to um, see if Julie would maybe would you like to come talk for like a minute um, Julie from Trick, Tr Julie Hendren from Trick Lock Theater is here and come you can in. just walk right in and you can grab well, that it's mic a staggered panel it's the yeah, old I, Carson format I know um, and just talk a little bit about um, and I'm sorry there's a it's kind of caught there there yeah and to talk a little about Trick Lock Theater and the Revolutions Festival. So you're, are, will you be performing at Revol Revolutions? Uh, I mean, you know what? Well, when it's international, Julie, so Julie I don't know called me and said, qualify. you know, hey, Re Revolutions is coming up and we want to talk to you about a show. I said, I'd love to play the Revolutions Festival. And Julie said, no, we don't ever want you at the <laughs> festival again. But would you do a fundraiser for us? So it's the next best thing. Hi, Julie. Hi. Welcome. This is Julie Hendren. Hello. Uh, Hi, everyone. What's your title with Trick Lock? I'm the Director of International Relations. There you and then go. I'm the curator of the festival. That's yeah. so cool. I love that you have that international angle um, with this company, and you guys bring amazing, amazing stuff. Yeah, thanks. Th thank you for bringing him to town. Of course. I know a lot of people <laughs> are really excited about the show. I don't know if people can still get tickets. There, we do um, have a few tickets left. left. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and how would people get those tickets? So... Um, you, you can go to chemo.com and get them. You can go mm -hmm. to tricklock.com and get them. Um, well, uh, chemo Theater is this beautiful, like, gorgeous theater amazing. in town. The yeah. historic. Yeah. yeah. It's really fabulous. Yeah. By the way, we, I want to say we played there last year on my tour. Congresswoman Michelle Lewin Grisham joined us I on saw stage. That. I saw that. And now she's your governor. So imagine Thank how much you. seeing this show can help <laughs> your professional life if you can. Like, took your wand. And exactly. That's it. I take I take partial credit for her. No, you as well you should. Yes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's we exciting. had Nancy Pelosi join us on stage last year. You did? She got a promotion. Oh man. Kirsten Cinema was running for Congress and came on one of my TV shows. Now she's the first openly bisexual senator. Maybe coming here will make you an openly bisexual elected <laughs> official someday. See you at the chemo tomorrow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about Revolutions, which is uh, this show will be supporting, and yeah. um, and feel free to throw in other cool stuff about Trick Lock. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, so Trick Lock is a 25-year-old. Um, so we're a predominantly devised physical theater, experimental theater group with a huge international sort of component. Um, so Revolutions, this is our 19th year. Uh, Three-week wow. international theater festival or performing arts festival. So predominantly theater, but dance, music, all that good stuff. Um, and really the focus of the festival is about bringing work from all over the world here as a way of sort of humanizing politics, of humanizing world affairs. How do we learn about each other, connect with each other, and the best way to do that is through stories, yeah. is, through, is through performance art, where people are live, right in front of us, and, and we can hear their stories, experience what's going on. And I tend to really love, when I'm curating it, I really do look for stuff that is like, you know, a little left of center. I like yeah. experimental work, political work, circus, physical theater, comedy, et cetera. A lot of music, too. I mean, uh, yeah. I've been at Trick Lock yes. events with so much, and uh, from like rockabilly to hip hop. I mean, yeah. culturally, I, I've always just been amazed the times I've been here at how broad your creative reach is. Yeah. Oh, that's so nice. Yeah. So. But I feel like that's how we learn. It's how it's how we get to know each other. It's 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 such a fascinating way of sort of um, learning about humans. <laughs> I mean, I know that's yeah. really kind of basic. Well, no, but I mentioned uh, you know and asked wh how how John felt about. Well, I don't assume that people may call him divisive. It's a divided. Um, uh, commute, you know, our, our population is divided and mm -hmm. our politics are divided and, you know, art and theater um, has obviously a really great opportunity to bring people together and to humanize, especially th through international mm. um, performances. I think that's such a great way to kind of try to crack that nut. Yeah. Um, I think especially with other cultures, other countries, because we, you know, we get a certain amount of information, right? And, and, and then when you actually are sitting down and you are watching, you know, uh, uh, an artist from Zimbabwe who is talking 
talking about um, you know, the politics of his nation and, and growing up with his father, et cetera, et cetera. You, 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 you're like, oh, oh, look at us. Just some people with some daddy issues and, you know, like complicated. It's all this. I mean, that is the thing that really sort of does connect us. It's is, the uniter. I mean, people yeah. around the world love America, not because of our political policies. Right. They love us because of our culture, our arts and our sports. Yes. <laughs> right. It's true. But, um, yeah, so w w remind me when, um, I'm sorry, I lost my tra train of thought. Remind me when revolutions happen. So, that's so it happens in March. March. Okay. So it's March 8th through the 30th. This is our 19th year. It's three weeks. And so, um, and this year I did a, a slightly different thing. We have more artists from the U.S. than we've ever had before this year. Yeah, I kind of was like, all right, like looking at the state of the nation and... And it made me sort of think about, like, what are the artists within our own nation? What, you know, what are the stories they are telling? And so, um, you know, so we have, it's really great. I mean, we have, we have some stories from immigrants. We have first generation artists. We have a lot of stories from women, people of color. Um, but really, you know, so there's a fair amount of U.S. artists. And then we also have um, this incredible woman like Chiara Guidi from Italy who, who creates work for children, but really sort of meaningful and dark, immersive work for children. And she's yep. doing a piece about, about child and parent separation and how do we, how do we deal with that. Wow. How about that? Uh, there's a group from Colombia that is doing an out outdoor stilt physical theater looking at walls and walls that separate us and what do we do when we're faced with walls and borders and, and things like that. Uh, There's a great piece from uh, UK and France, Palmyra, that's about Syria. Really, it's two men really looking at aggression, violence, and how do we as humans deal with that? Where mm -hmm. does that come from and why do we behave in that way? So it's, cool. so it's and then there's a ton of funny stuff. We have lots of clowns. Shinoa Allen yeah. is coming back from Pajama oh, Men. Wow. Oh, sweet. Guys are yeah. Yeah, with Nina Conti, who's this incredible, incredible um, um, puppet ventriloquist comedian. She's like huge in London. She's uh, she's like amazing. And they have a duo act called Monkey and Roy. So it's just awesome. going to be an, an every an everything for everybody it festival. It begins March 9th, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, actually, awesome. the kickoff party is March 8th. March 8th. Yeah, March 8th. Uh, and you can, you can find your theater at Revolution. Excuse me, at a uh, Trick Clock. Trick Clock. Dot com. Yep. Trick Clock. Com. Yep. Okay. Cool. Yep. yep. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I love what you do. I love um, that festival. and You can see why like, I would want to come here and do a fundraiser for this because for what Julie sure. does and what you know, everyone here, I mean, you know, my, my friend Kate was the one who really got me to understand how incredible and vital this culture is. And so I'm really just – also the ventriloquist refused to come if I was there well, at that time, so I'm here early. Well, yeah. So, yeah. People I'm, don't I'm, really want to talk appetizer. about that. Yeah. Yeah. We really can't. I mean, this is John. I'm the foreplay for the actual. <laughs> yeah. He's also, though, I was telling him last night at the airport, I, you know, I mean, arts funding is no joke. It's really dismal. And he's yeah. he's a little bit saving our festival. Like, by donating his time and his resources, we can't. It, he This show is going to allow for two companies to be able to come. That's that we amazing. didn't have the money really to bring them before. I mean, we were pushing forward. Right. <laughs> but, you know, the money is so. Well, it's, it's a good, it's I think, huge. a good example of how communities come together and times like you know what's happening politically yeah. i mean i've noticed uh, friends of mine who are in fundraising and development sometimes they say in the worst political climate you know the funding might dry up yeah. um from the feds or whatever but but people but artists like, come together you know, come and they together. pay it forward yeah. and yeah. again i would do anything Thank for this for company that. the chance to come here and like do a 90 minute show uh oh it's going to be very long by the way <laughs> uh in a beautiful theater for a great crowd in a town i love to support a company in a festival like this, it's just, it's it's joyful all the way. I would do anything for this company. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I wanted Thanks, to, baby. before I let you guys go, um, see, I invited some people from our creative community. There's a great um, group called Coffee and Creative, so I put it out to them and a few other people. I don't know if anybody had any questions for um, for our guest here today. You, sir, Andrew. way in the back in the, la in the last <laughs> row. Could yes, you, sir. Could you... Um, here, somebody maybe hand him a mic just so it gets onto the actual recording. There we go. There we go. Thank oh, you. Oh, it's all part of the mise en scene. Um, thanks for coming. Thank you. Uh, do you have any critics in your past, maybe your very deep, dark past, critics who really knocked you back? You took them seriously, and what they said was not easy to digest. And what did they say? Great question. All the time. Oh. All the time. <laughs> Still. <laughs> I mean... You know, as as Yoda says, failure is the greatest teacher. So sure, I, I had a lot, and sometimes you you have to listen to the critics, and sometimes you know, you'll really learn, especially in the age of social media, when there's so many 
men who uh, are cowards and live in their parents' basements and hide their name and identity to go on the internet and attack uh, people um, for empathy. But yeah, uh, you know, specifically, um, wow, I wasn't ready for that one. There, there's so many examples of me getting things so wrong. But, uh, you know, I, I, I had a, a comedian, Rick Overton, who's an Emmy-winning writer who I've loved, and he's been in every movie you've ever seen. And he took me aside once, and he said, uh, never, ever make fun of artists. I was like making fun of, you know, some actor's scandal or something, and he was just like, nope, you gotta, you, even if you don't like him, punch up, you know, don't punch down. And one of the best pieces of advice I got was to don't attack right-wing voters, attack the policies they vote for, because these folks are suckered, and, you know, uh, it, all, there, there's no, all great comedy comes from punching up, from going after those in power. They always say, why isn't there any great conservative comedy? There are great, great, brilliant conservative comics, but they generally don't do conservative material because essentially, going by the dictionary, you're defending the status quo. So like, if you came out and did material, you know, like when I would see guys try to do anti-Obamacare stuff, it's like, but you're defending the culture as it is now, not the people who are trying to change it. I'll make fun of the methods they're using and the policies they're trying to change it with. But if you were, and this is why, you know, in, in medieval times, the only person who could uh, tell the king the truth was the jester because he made it funny. He was the only one who could punch up. You go to a comedy club and you'll see performers like making fun of uh, uh, homeless people or, or the developmentally disabled people. You know, I can't believe how many comics still use the word retard in clubs. And it's mean, and it's hacky, and it's lazy. Uh, so w when I was really first taught, you know, don't make fun of artists, make fun of people in real power, that was a great lesson for me. Except really I will make fun of celebrities, because fuck the Kardashians. <laughs> Not artists, no craft. Awesome. Any other questions? Okay. There we go. All right. Well, thank you again. Thank you, Perry. Really what a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Delightful to meet me. you, have you at the office. Great to see you as always, Julie. You as Julie. well, thanks. Really looking forward to the show. Thank you. I'll be there on Saturday. Hooray. And uh, yeah, get tickets again. Say it one more time where people so, can go. So yeah, so chemo.com. Chemo.com. And also, if you go to tricklock.com, on the homepage right there, there's a giant button on John's face, get tickets here. Yeah. Also, there will be tickets. I th There should be tickets still available at the show. Well, there's a few set aside, so Sweet. you can and, also just show I, up. I may just throw out my act and do Louis C.K.'s entire act from Governors <laughs> last week, uh, you know, because um, <laughs> those, those, those Parkland <laughs> kids, they're a bit smug. Let's take them down. See what I mean? Huh? Speaking of punching yeah, you're down. Going right. You're going after <laughs> transgender children? When you, yeah. so. Awesome. That'll be great. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks. again. Thanks.